Welcome to the third of four very special events this summer celebrating the CCA MFA in Comics program. My name is Matt Sillity. I chair the program, and we're thrilled that you're here. Um, all, thank you. <laughs> Usually, we have an amazing cartoonist come in, and we get to hear from them and ask them questions. But in this case, not only is or tonight is it one of our very own, but two, it's to celebrate the greatest accomplishment that any cartoonist could do, and that is finishing a book. <sighs> the, the person who's going to be introducing Nicole Georges tonight is, of course, one of my very favorite people in the world, probably one of your very favorite people in the world, was the first professor uh, in the program. Uh, he's, he's known far and wide for being... Today, you, you referred to yourself as cuter than smart. I thought that was... <laughs> <laughs> I'll take whatever, whatever superlative you want to give me, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with it. Um, but, uh, but let's give a nice round of applause to one of our favorite professors in our program, Justin Hall. I put on a nice new t-shirt, like this is all like my new t-shirt, it doesn't have a comic book logo on it, so it's like my fancy one, I know. I still haven't figured out how to wear a collar, but I have everything else going on. Um, I am so excited tonight because we are like celebrating one of my favorite people in the world. Um, <sighs> Nicole J. Georges uh, is a writer and an illustrator who has been publishing her, her own zines and comics for 20 years. Um, she is the author of the Lambda award-winning graphic memoir, Calling Dr. Laura, which is amazing, and you should totally get it, uh, and the diary comic, Invincible Summer. Uh, she is also our professor here at California College of the Arts. She is all ours. She is our people. Um, and she's also always the most fabulous person in the room. Have you noticed that? Um, she also thinks that dairy is rape. <laughs> <All right. laughs> that was, that was the, <laughs> she was about to shout that over, over Matt. So, um, um, so let's give, let's, uh, you know, give a huge round of, of welcome for uh, Nicole J. Georges. Amazing. <laughs> Thanks, students and friends. Uh, I have two special guest readers tonight. One of them is going to, uh, let me see if I can pronounce his name right. His name is Justin Hall. Uh, <laughs> he'll be doing some of the voices. And the other person is a very special guest. Her name is Julia Wirtz. <laughs> Let's just take it away. Pranyo's not going to do any voices. I know. All right, let's take right. it away. Can I put the dog on this? <laughs> you sit? Sit. Right. She has performance anxiety. All right. <laughs> Just look right here, pretend like we're all naked. <laughs> all right, we're starting. <laughs> Beja Georges attacked two children on the occasion of her 15th birthday. It's her quinceanera. Oh, she's of age. She can date now. I don't think so. But she is excited to get her learner's permit. I remember when I first met Benja, you told me you just gave her a VO5 hot oil treatment. I did not. I swear. <laughs> and you told me not to pet her, but I did anyway, and she barked at me. It was worth it. She was so soft. She sprung after a kindergartner as I was grilling pizzas. <laughs> Beja, that was very bad. Bad, now you have to wear a leash like a common criminal at your own party. One time I came over and she had like a leopard print bandage wrapped around her body. Oh yeah, she got into a fight. And you had a matching leopard print skirt on, like a cave woman. I was in solidarity. Hmm. Then she tackled a toddler while we ate. <laughs> huh? <laughs> Get off my child. <laughs> How 
many children were hurt in the, in the filming of this? <laughs> only two children were invited to the party, so only two children were hurt at the party. <laughs> they actually weren't invited. So it's their fault. <laughs> it's the parents' fault, but I tried to write around that. <laughs> because Beja had attacked one of their children before, and then they brought their kids to the dog's birthday party, so whose fault is it really? <laughs> You could have been killed. Damn it, Beja. I could have put Beja in the kennel, tuned out the barking, and chosen to go upstairs without her. I could have even have given this dog up at the first sign of her behavioral issues or her badness. But I would never do any of those things. As it was, I had owned and loved this decidedly bad dog from my childhood to adulthood, and she was as much a part of me as I was of her. That's how a bad dog brought me home. <laughs> da, da, da. <laughs> okay, so I got this dog, Beja, for my high school boyfriend, whose name in this book is Tom. Um, I was 16, he was 16. He had had a dachshund as a puppy, but his mean dad made him give it away, and so I thought I could fix his childhood by getting him a dachshund. And I had always wanted a Sharpay, inspired by New Kids on the Block, and John had a Sharpay named Nico, if you watch the cartoon. So um, anyway, my greatest hope was that we could find a dog that was both of these things, and then I found this very special dog that's a dachshund Sharpay at a disreputable shelter in Kansas that let me adopt it with my mom as long as we said it was for our family and not a gift. It was a gift. So when I went to give it to him, his dad, his alcoholic stepdad the day before Christmas was like, you can't have the dog, give it back to the shelter. And I was like, she'll get put to sleep, I could never. Um, so I kept her in my mom's house in suburban Kansas. That's Beja as a puppy. Fresh, there's some bongo drums in the corner for you guys. This is just so you can see the layout of the page. My stepfather, Pete, was a true man's man. He washed the dogs like he washed his sports car with a hose outside each of our houses. Floridian townhome, Kansas duplex, and cul-de-sac two-story. Pete actually bought my mom a dog shortly before I acquired Beja. Paco was a manly, muscular purebred. Hey, Pac. Paco earned his spot in their household through loyalty, congeniality, and athleticism. He loved men, was a man, and exuded horse appeal. This is my favorite panel because he's lifting the weight and his arms going the wrong way. <laughs> a classically hysterical female, Beja was the opposite of this invited guest. Stubby and stubborn, she hated every man except for Faye Tom. <sighs> this natural machismo was one thing Pete could not compromise. He was a man who sneezed like a bark. <coughs> <coughs> Balanced on scaffolding at his construction job like he was an acrobat and cut off his fingertips fixing a spinning lawnmower blade. They'll grow back. Ew. <laughs> Beja was very happy in her new suburban home, but she and Pete could not come to a compromise. Burr, burr, burr. She was part beagle. What's going on? Burr, 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 I was just trying burr, to wipe her burr, damn paws. Burr, burr. She sounds. She uh. She sounds like she's getting raped. I'll do it. Burp, 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 burp. Shh, burp. Come on, Paco. Jesus, that dog. I swear. I didn't know it then. Okay, you're free. But Beja's fear of Pete and subsequent screaming would repeat itself with almost every man who crossed our path. I was a feral child. I was hot. Before I had you, I had a 24-inch waist. I was a model. I came later in my mother's life after she extended, expended the majority of her maternal resources on my older sisters. And my sister did give me a note on this book, which is that those maternal resources were not there. <laughs> <laughs> Nikki. I got away with murder. As it stood, I acted like a wolf, a rogue, undisciplined one. So my teeth rotted out from neglect, from bottle rot, and I had to go to the dentist to get them all filed down and replaced and capped. And they had to strap me down and I literally bit the dentist. Even after my teeth rotted out, I was still fed sugar to pacify me. Gummy bears, please! Nicole, you know that's not good for you. Ugh, just let her have them. My precious. <laughs> 
May, give me the scissors. I'll just cut this knot out. <laughs> I never followed rules because there were no rules. Just the questionable efficiency of quick fixes. Okay, I'm going to draw a poem for mom. I know it's good. A woman likes to hear if boobs are big, so she'll be happy if I say, okay, fat. Her boobs are fat, and they could kill a rat. Wait, no, I like rats. I only felt the edges of our world when I accidentally crossed them. Dear mom, your boobs are so fat, they could not kill a rat. <laughs> Sick. Nikki, what is this trash? But, but I thought... <laughs> With the amount of structure I was given, one could logically come to the conclusion I'd have been better off in a wolf pack. Raised by wolves, I would have fallen in line with the organization and control of my fellow pack mates, with a job and boundaries and an idea of how to behave. All right, so this is, this is Beja G. Uh, and we're going to move forward a little bit. Eventually, she got kicked out of my mom's house, and Tom and I had to move in together as teenagers in order to keep her. And then we wanted to move out of Kansas. We didn't know where. We didn't care. So we chose Portland, Oregon. So it's 17 years ago. We chose to move to Portland on a whim. The need to leave Kansas City was strong, but the destination was less set. I drove for three days and entered Oregon in the pouring rain. Tom was stoned on Valium, and I had a tension headache from navigating through steep mountains in the night. The rain let up as we approached our new neighborhood, shabby and within sight of the forest and mountaintops. Portland was dirty and quirky. It felt like home. Oh, my God. I could see the mountains from my rooftop, a dog park across the street, and it rained a little all the time. This place was mine. We felt like adults but showed our age by inaugurating our Fremont Street home with a wrestling party and punk <laughs> show. Ah, wrestling party, pie eating contest, bands. We posted flyers all over our new town, and the night of the show, young punks came out in droves. I locked Beja in my bedroom. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> our, our house was forged as a punk space forevermore. No hands allowed in the eating contest. Our house is an underground music venue, a party destination, a space for transient friends of friends to sleep on the floor, and a dormitory for the recently teenaged seeking low, low rents. Shh, there's people sleeping on the floor. Oh, my closet? Yeah, it's $75 a month. Cool. cool. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Everything we had was makeshift and imperfect. Vintage, but chipped like the boxcar children. Our treasured mid-century Formica table whose metal legs swayed when you leaned on it. Watch out. The fluffy beige carpet now mottled with thick dog pee stains. Every 1960s dress I owned whose hem was fixed with staples. My stains were drawn over in Sharpie and shirts held closed only with the grace of safety pins. Perfect. Nothing came new or really nice, but we didn't seem to notice. We didn't know any different, and it didn't seem to matter. Tom and I broke up within three months of arriving at our new home. Maybe it's just a break. <laughs> yeah. I'll always love you. We're best friends. I, I know we can make this work. This is me pretending like I smoke. <laughs> this is my emo voice. Emo Tom moved his belongings to the basement, <laughs> and we continued living together. I have acting range. It didn't take long for our friendship facade to fracture. Yeah, I'm actually so in love. Oh, really? Yeah. I never knew I could feel this way. Oh, that's funny. I was just thinking the same thing. <laughs> we each found rebound dates, and Beja began to pee on the floor with regularity. We fought over who would buy dog food. Who would walk her? And why Tom didn't defend her when the roommates called Beja crazy? Yeah, bunch of crazy dogs. <laughs> if you don't watch out, I'll take full custody of Beja. Okay. I was shocked that Tom took me up on my empty threat and how easily he let her go. 
Come on, Beja. Let's go. Let's go to the dog park. There you go, you're free. Burp, burp, burp. Such a dirty little dog. Yeah, I'm not doing that. It's so dirty. annoying. <laughs> Try not to enjoy the grass. My God. Oh, my God. Oh, oh donuts. Oh, donuts. Donuts. <laughs> Stop some donuts. Yeah, yeah. Let's go with not give to that dirty little dog. Yeah. Yeah. No, little bitch. <laughs> <laughs> little, little, that little dirty little punk rock bitch. She's not getting my donuts. Beja! <laughs> <laughs> God, screaming. Ugh. Going deaf. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want their fucking donuts anyway. <laughs> Come on, Beja. Yeah, good riddance. Good riddance, ew. <laughs> Whatever. Oh, look. Hey, wee. Yeah, yeah. Woo-hoo. <laughs> Whimsical. Hey, I don't want to do that. Hey, Beja, look. Wee. <laughs> Why'd you do that? <laughs> All right, let's go. Beja and I had some things in common. Don't touch her side. <sighs> That's her crazy spot. In fact, a boy who tried to date me called me a monster. You're like a gremlin. You have so many rules. I'm not. You have to eat at odd intervals. No one's allowed to ask questions when you wake up, and you don't get you can't get <laughs> wet after midnight. That's not supposed to be a sex thing. It's supposed to be a gremlin thing. I can too get wet after midnight. <laughs> but if you followed these elaborate rituals and rules, then we were fine. We were nice. I made you a valentine. There's a different note in each tea bag of this box. Otherwise, we seem very unwieldy in particular. Don't bend over. I can't drink this coffee. What is this, 7-Eleven? I'd rather just do speed to wake up. Her barking and me snapping. The boy I dated post-Tom bugged us both equally. Look, it's like a magician and my power is to annoy. I'm not even touching her. It's like a, it's like a, a theremin. It's like a theremin. It's a... The music thing goes as you touch it. In truth, he thought it was funny to push our buttons. We were easy targets for instant comedy. Is this pubic parking? (laughs) Oh my God. I told you, I don't like being asked questions right after I wake up. (laughs) Needless to say, this relationship did not last. We were both controlled by our animal minds, me and Beja. Nicole's rules, a.k.a. Krabby boundaries. One, do not ask questions when I wake up or just get home from work or while I'm eating. Ew, what's that? <laughs> hey, uh, how, do, you know, do, you, do you know how much the trash bell is? Do you think this is black mold? No. Have you seen the can opener? Two, do not try to stand in between me and good coffee or snacks. Oh, I finished the coffee in there. And I ate all the cupcakes. Oh, I'm gonna kill you. Do not wake me up unless absolutely necessary. Bye. I'm going to work. Bye. Are you awake? Oh, sorry. I just turned on the lights. Just go. <laughs> oh, whatever. <laughs> if I am injured, do not touch me. Fuck. Uh, are you Are you okay? I'm fine. <laughs> Updates. I am unable to eat or parallel park while being spontaneously non-consensually watched. (laughs) It's not a free show, (laughs) a-hole. Me trying to maintain some mental space and order in the aftermath of a chaotic childhood. Beja, an instinct, distrustful and fearful from an antisocial puppyhood. Things you cannot do to Beja. One, cut nails. Two, bent at waist. I have literally never hurt you. And that's her springing at me at the bottom. Brush teeth, pick her up, sit near her bed. Does does see her hair up on her back? Be a man, be a child, be a dog with any shred of dominance. These are artists' representations of these things. Quit it, Beja. 
Note, Nicole and a very select group of fearless friends can brave these. The rules we kept were to keep our lives feeling safe, mine from the unseen pull of irritation and hers from fear and surprise. Unfortunately, our rules were frequently broken and inflexible, we both snapped. It's me making a, sh a flyer for my show. Uh, I just want you to know that sliding scale one to two dollars. This is from 2002. <laughs> How many people paid one dollar? I uh, probably the majority of them were like two dollars. <laughs> come on, man. What do I look like, a Rockefeller? <laughs> ah, perfect flyer. Let's go put these up. Burr, 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 burr. So many people threatened to call the Humane Society when I tied her up outside of places. Mmm, nice coffee. Here you, fella. Burr, burr. <gasps> Beja! Oh no, I'm so sorry. That dog's crazy. <gasps> she's crazy. Oh, oh, she's crazy. Watch out. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not crazy. You were just surprised. He snuck up on you and he didn't ask. Why can't people see what I see? You're not like a stuffed animal for them to touch. Because they're disrespectful, that's why. Well, you know what? Fuck that guy. Hey. Can't talk. Too busy thinking. Brain's full. Quack, 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 quack. Ding. Beja, I've got it. Mm-hmm. OK, this is a manifesto I wrote for my dog when I was 21 years old. <laughs> It's called, I am not a stuffed animal. When is it appropriate to touch a dog who you've never met? If said dog refuses to be touched by you or acts defensively based on the contact you have initiated, does this classify him or her as a bad dog? Why is it appropriate or acceptable to touch animals you've never met but not people based on their cuteness? Would it make someone a bad person if they lash out at you, a stranger, for invading their personal space? Do you see animals as personal property or as individuals? If seen as property, is it acceptable to invade their space and expect them to conform to your standards of acceptable dog behavior without taking into account their issues or personal history with human beings? Do you see animals as autonomous beings with their own motivations, thoughts, and emotions, or are they objectified as property, as something cute like a stuffed animal who you are entitled to receive pleasure from through petting, doing tricks, etc.? And then Beja says, I have autonomy as a dog. I can create boundaries. It is my right to say you cannot touch me, and that is okay. <laughs> Well, it has a typo. <laughs> Readies. Anyway, come on, Beja. The end of that part. Uh, can we please thank and bid adieu to my special guests? Yay. Thank you very thank you much. You. Oh my god, you were the best dog park yoga lady. <laughs> now I'm. <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit about process. Uh, mm, I'm so good with this for right now. Oh, yeah, I do need this in a second. Thank you. All right, this is Beja as Dumbo. And then you can't really see, but I'm the mouse in her hat. This is Beja in her older years eating a stalk of broccoli. Okay, so uh, no, no spoilers, but uh, dogs have a limited lifespan. And so after 16 years together, Beja, George's flew to the Rainbow Bridge. And I was bereft. And at the same time, Calling Dr. Laura came out, and I didn't know what to do with myself after a book tour, and my house was a tomb now, after my best friend was gone. And so I was like, what do I do? And I was like, I guess I should do something I've always wanted to do, but couldn't do because of the dog. And I was like, I'm gonna go do a fellowship at the Center for Cartoon Studies in White River Junction, Vermont. So, exactly. So I went to White River Junction for a essentially a year to the Center for Cartoon Studies. Uh, before there, I picked up this little piece named Ponyo uh, a little too soon, but she was my best friend there. But while I was there, I got to interact with other cartoonists, and some cartoonists I really admired. Uh, and I was driving Chris Ware from the airport. Now there's the, me at CCS in the library. You should visit sometime. Uh, with Ponyo. As you can see, this was going on for a long time. <laughs> Uh, Chris Ware is, I, I want to say he's one of my favorite cartoonists because he's a cartoonist I really admire and who I think is incredible. Um, this, this came from somebody's brain. This was a blank piece of paper at some point. 
So I was driving him from the airport, and I was rambling on about Beja because that's just what was happening then for me. I was just like sweating it out. I was like, Beja was like the baby I had in high school. And Chris Ware turned around and was like, oh, that would make a good line in a graphic novel. You know, it was like this dog was like the baby we had in high school. And I just, I felt like an idea had been handed, had been chosen for me by the comic gods. You know, I had all these different ideas, like, do I do a queer animal utopia book? Do I do a collection of diary comics? What do I do? And then I was like, oh, the Beja book is clearly the thing to do. And so I decided to draw Fetch. If you know that Chris Ware is a weird looking guy, you can appreciate how hard it was to try and do a respectful <laughs> and handsome rendering of him. You know what I mean? It's like no offense to him, but like, for real. Okay, so <laughs> I decided I wanted to make this book and like, where do you start? Well, I started, this is the back of an envelope. I started making a timeline. I was like, okay, what happens? I know I get the dog, I know the dog dies. What are other important things in between? Okay, uh, she has to act bad at some point. I tried to give her away, people kept giving her back. My mom tried to give her away, I went and got her. Uh, I trained her, I wrote her a manifesto, that seems important. She trained me at some point. Okay, those are the major things I wanna put in there. And then to sell the book, the publisher was having an easier time if we could classify the chapters thematically, and so we did it as dog commands. And so I made all these different pieces of paper that were like, sit, stay, like she couldn't actually do any of those things, but you know. <laughs> sit, stay, heal, whatever. And then I wrote down every anecdote I could think of about Beja. You know, like, oh, you know, the time Beja jumped in someone's lap for the first time and they started crying out of joy. Or like, you know, the, the time that she, you know, the mailman just stopped delivering to our house. And you know, all the different things. I wrote them down and I tried to put them on this timeline to see if they would work. And then I found the things that seemed like too much or I saw where holes were and I just, kind of physically, systematically moved them around until the story made sense to me. And then we made the book pitch, and then the publisher was like, sure. Also, here's Ponyo getting warm in front of a space heater because we're in Vermont. And also, I'm wearing very unfashionable woolen booties because we're in Vermont. And also, here, these are booties that I got from like a grandma in Vermont because you have to take off your shoes at the door because they're covered in snow. I just want you guys to know I thumbnailed this twice. And the first three rows know what that means and the back rows do not. So cartoonists, when we write, we kind of storyboard really fast when we're getting the, the ideas out of our head and writing them visually, and that's called thumbnailing. And so my first version is just for me and it's kind of like fucked up looking and not perfect. So I went through that and I also did free writes on the different places and different people I would include in this book. So like the punk house we lived in, or you know, certain people I had dated, like how did they walk, how did they talk, how did they smell, what happened there? You know, the kind of stuff I make you do in class. Um, and that, but that's how I got little tiny details that made it real. And so I did a rough draft book, basically by myself, of my first version of thumbnails. Um, and I also interviewed people who knew Beja and I said, do you remember the first time you met Beja, what happened? Do you remember the first time she let you pet her? What are your memories of Beja? What are your memories of Beja and I together? People said things like, uh, I remember her face looked like she had been through a windshield because she had so many scars from picking fights with other dogs. Um, so this is a version of that first scene where she attacks the kid, but in my first thumbnailed version. Like I just knew essentially what I wanted to happen. And then I had to do it all in a way that my editor could look at and actually read. And so I tried to make an order and I made final thumbnails. So I thumbnailed it another time. And this is my version of easy to read. But this is, you know, from the thing you were just looking at. Like there's my friend talking about the first time we met. Look at how uh, much more vicious the dog attack is in the bottom of this. <laughs> she really looks like she's like digging in, but she didn't. Uh, I also was wondering, because I was tired of my own style after calling Dr. Laura, and I was reading other books, I was like, what if I did the whole book in pencil? I did not do the whole book in pencil, but wouldn't that have been fun? Um, I isolated myself to finish these thumbnails at a place called the Southwester, where Julie and I have both been. Uh, it's basically vintage travel trailers by the sea in Oregon or in Washington, so it's very moody and dark and stormy and cold. And I isolated myself for 10 days doing an artist residency to finish these thumbnails and just write the book. I made crazy goals for myself. These are my goals from each month. You guys understand, the, the, students, under, the students are like, what the fuck is the matter with you? Um, I don't think I exactly did these goals, but I went pretty nuts. 
I make a thermometer to get myself going, and starting a thermometer is a really harsh thing. Uh, just so you know, the outlines mean I've penciled it, and when it's filled in, it means I've inked it. None of these have been inked yet, but I dated it, 128.15. Um, I posed for all my own drawings with my camera phone, so I have bazillions of these in my computer, like so many of me, lots of places. Speaking of lots of places, this book was made in about 10 different places in two countries. This is Portland, Oregon, my home studio. That's just some inking at a drawing table. But then I have, this is my CCA apartment from last year. I had an art, art moving company ship all my books down. Um, the guy that called me a gremlin now works for an art moving company, which is great. Uh, but so I was like using the TV in my apartment as like a board to look at my stuff. I have my thermometer there on the left. I have my to-do list. I have my, you know, tabletop drafting thing. I have my smock. It's posing for my own pictures. And then we went to Virginia for a residency at the College of William and Mary. Go, go tribe. <laughs> and uh, I had an apartment in Richmond and I um, also brought my tabletop drawing thing there and made it work. And underneath that chair is a bookshelf I made out of a cardboard box, not to brag. I turned it on its side and you know what? That was furniture. Uh, the pages are 14 by 17. Students would like to know that. I do everything on the same layer like a crazy person. I do all my own lettering by hand, which could change at some point. But I just like making the art pieces and I like having them be finished products because that's fun for me and you have to find little nuggets of fun. Um, this was towards the end. I bought this like crazy hard luggage case to carry because the book was 90 pounds. All those originals and all those books. That's over 300 pages. There's my thermometer almost done. It's getting crazy because I put dates on the side so I can see. Look at my crazy eye there. Uh, this is like a random bit of notes I found from like midway through. You get kind of hard into this stuff at a certain point. I'm going to give you guys this as writing prompts in class. <laughs> Draw more cancer. Draw gay shit. Consider mentioning vegan versus ham. Make me look weirder than I do. Okay, so my wrist collapsed after calling Dr. Laura. I finished the first draft of this book and then I got a tattoo and I slept weird and the next day my wrist had collapsed and was non-functional. I couldn't turn a key in a door. I couldn't cut a bagel, I couldn't open a car door. Um, so I started wearing a mitt to sleep in, and then working through this, I was like on an anti-inflammatory diet. I was taking turmeric every day. I was doing lots of stretches, lots of breaks. And then I was wearing this ice pack at the end of every night. I have a coach. I have a productivity coach, some of you know, Alec Longstreth. He is a very prolific cartoonist, and if you wanna talk about workaholism, he would be my workaholic sponsor. It's like the anti-12. This was a text from towards the end of the book. I am so sick of working on this book. The last 10% takes 90% of the effort. Luckily, you've got tons of grit and are tough as nails. You are stronger than that book. Thank you, coach. <laughs> Nicole is greater than book. <laughs> okay, so then another thing I was doing towards the end was my wrist was feeling kind of flimsy, so I was wrapping it every day after work. Because at a certain point, I was like, I need an extension on this book. It's, gonna, it's too much. And they were like, well, Alison Bechdel's book is coming out right after yours, or it's supposed to, and so if you don't finish it by this one date in nine months, um, then we're gonna sit on it for a year. And I was like, oh, I better do it. Um, I sent this to my friend. Do you want a ha ham job? Hands? No way, from you, you'd be so rough. <laughs> this was one of my like homemade wrist devices. I have an old scratchy bandage. Getting real feral at the end. Just doing corrections in uh, pro white, white ink. Finished it. Ponyo's in the background on a, on a thing. <laughs> Finished it, psyched. Um, this was one of the drafts of what I wanted the first page to be. This is a draft of what I wanted the cover to look like. This is the, I finished this at Carson Ellis's farm in Tualatin, Oregon. It's just an acrylic painting with ink on it and some gouache. Uh, my pages are too big for me to scan without going crazy, so I took them to an architectural scanner that has a drum scanner. And then my production assistant, a former student named Asher Craw, um, I paid him to go through and do all the final Photoshop-y kind of production stuff. That's his dog who helped him. And that's, that's the book. I wanna show you one more thing from our working process. So you're a cartoonist, so you know it's like very isolating and you kind of lose your mind a little bit. So um, this is what we did, every, like a lot, like every night.
And that's it. Let's go do it. All right, so we're going to move over to the other side. Oh, we're going to move over to the other side of the stage, and like magic, <clears throat> light will appear over there. So um, I'm going to I'm going to ask some questions and try to delve into your secrets, <gasps> um, the ones that you haven't already shared. <laughs> I don't know, what you, my teeth rotted out. What else do you want to know? <laughs> okay. okay. And then we'll also have some time uh, for some Q and A as well towards the end. So uh, okay, so. I, this book is remarkable. I actually um, am allergic to dogs, and I hate codependent relationships. Mm -hmm. um, so I really have, I have a hard time with dogs as pets. I really don't like them. Um, no offense. Um, but, but like, I cried at the end of this book. Aww. Nicole J. George's, what did you do? I, I, <laughs> I just, just <laughs> stuck it in. and oh. It was a story. I realized I hadn't been able to talk about Beja in public without crying, and I really haven't until the book party a week ago. Um, you know, like my voice feels like <laughs> when I talk about her too much. So it just yeah. was what I was feeling and just yeah. trying to transmit that. Well, I mean, oftentimes memoir, I mean, I think we, any of us who have done memoir work, you run into this where it's like, it is as much, you know, process therapy as it is art. Um, so uh, did it, uh, and, and so talk about how that worked as a process, like giving um, your relationship with Beja a kind of narrative arc and giving it kind of structure, did that help you process it and help you deal with it or not? I mean, and you also had to relive all this stuff with Beja day after day after day. Yeah, when you're doing, when you're writing about any experience, you know, I'm sure all of you have that experience when you're drawing something, you start, you realize you've been making the face of the person whose face you're drawing. <laughs> and it's just like that feeling, like the living embodiment of the thing. So every page, you know, like it just sucked. Like those times, you know, and it happened with Dr. Laura too, it just, those moments just sucked. It was like putting on the ring from Lord of the Rings, where I was like, whoosh, whoosh, I was like back in it. <laughs> and then I have to come out of it and talk to normal people. But like yeah. I isolated myself hardcore for this book. So like in Virginia, when I came out of it, there was no one else there except for Ponyo. So then I'd be like, let's just dance to Katy Perry and order some food. Um, <laughs> But um, I don't even remember your original question. Was it hard? Well, I, well I'm well, clearly a hard, it was right? Hard. But yeah, but, but did did it um at the end of the process? Did you feel differently uh, about? Did you feel? Uh, I don't. Did it did it feel solved? Yeah, I, I solved you know? is probably the wrong word, but yeah, did it? I don't know. You know, like Colin, Dr. Laura, I think did something for me. Mm -hmm. But fetch the thing that this did for me was I felt like I gave. I watch something tear up. I felt like I gave her a proper memorial. Yeah. Which. I wasn't able to do, because when she died, she died the week my book came out. Mm -hmm. And so I had to like go on the radio the yeah. next day and like in front of studio <laughs> audiences like this and be like, family trauma, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and they'd be like, do you want us to mention your dog? And I was like, don't fucking mention your dog. You know, <laughs> our friends came and they hugged me a little too long because they knew I just put my dog to sleep and I was like, let me go. <laughs> so I just kind of had to like leave home. Yeah. And yeah. she was home. Yeah. And so yeah. this was... I felt like I did something for her that I wanted to do. Yeah, memorials are important. I mean, it's, yeah. yeah. Um, so, are, are you done with memoir? Or, I mean, <laughs> how? No! <laughs> I have a great book I want to do. I mean, I'm still thinking about it. I love memoir. Mm -hmm. It's so rich. Yeah. I mean, there's so many other things I want to do. Yeah. Like, I'm doing this gender project with Judith Butler, mm -hmm. where I fly around the country interviewing kids about gender, and oh. then we're going to make that an illustrated book for them. Um, oh but my I also, God. I want to do a book called My Straight Year from Venus to Mars and back again. Um, <laughs> because I had like, a, when I went to CCS, I had a year of going retro oh. and like dating a dude and it just, you know, it didn't go mm. great. But I just <laughs> think that's an interesting story from both sides. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, if I can do that without hurting him, that mm -hmm. would be great. So, so that's always an interesting question with memoir, right? How much do you actually need to care about who you hurt or yeah. how are you truthful to the people that in the story and do, yeah. do you think about do, do you do you uh, show drafts of thi uh, things to your no? <laughs> 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 oh yeah, we just had somebody in class today. Some people were talking like, oh, you always show them drafts and it's the mm. most ethical thing to do. I'm like a like a weird tat tattletale <laughs> hermit. I don't. You have to be a little ruthless. I believe uh -huh. in writing like your family is dead and then mm, you can edit like mm. they're alive. You know that your sister's in the audience, right? Well, I know. I love my <laughs> sister. Well, you edit like they're alive. You know what I mean? And it's just... Good point. 
I don't I just have always been a tattletale. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, like the band that I was in in the book I was making yeah. the flyer for, our whole band was based <coughs> off of talking shit about some guy that was mean to me. And our band was called The Sour Grapes. Uh -huh. And our first song was called I Want to Set You on Fire. <laughs> so, you know, I'm just like, you know, be nice in class <laughs> and like turn in your work on time and everything will be fine. <laughs> That's right. But, uh, no, I, if but not, I, you might show up in a book later. <laughs> I believe as memoirists, you have a responsibility to be ethical and to mm. not use your platform as a way to like out other people. That's yeah. not the point. Right, right, right. The point is to tell your emotional truth and to tell a story. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm calling Dr. Laura, every time I showed someone doing something bad, like my mom or my, bo my, what, my girlfriend, I made sure, I actually literally made a list and I would make, I would draw them doing something good. Because nobody is one-sided, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know? And I also make sure I show myself doing bad things mm -hmm. or questionable things or acting crazy in ways where it would, where their, what they did would kind of make sense right, right. a little bit. So, I mean, uh, the, the relationship to truth in memoir is always kind of interesting, right? Because ultimately your primary uh, responsibility is to the book, which is a narrative, which is a story. And, you know, uh, memory is a narrative project anyway. Uh, memoir is like another level of that, right? So I, I used to always have these kind of, confrontations with my husband because I had a true travel tale series mm -hmm. and he was like it's supposed to be true and I was like it's a tale so <laughs> <laughs> well you're um, not a yeah. journalist you're well, a memoirist mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and there's a difference so so what is that difference I think it's the emotional truth versus the facts like mm. I like say like in, you know in here not so much but in calling Dr. Laura you know, there were these two girls that kind of conspired to ruin my life. It is like when I was in my 20s, like one girl cheated with my girlfriend and the other girl usurped me from my band. Mm. And then they both joined the band together. And I knew if I had drawn each of them and their things, A, it would have been boring for readers. And they would have been like, why are there mm -hmm. so many white lesbians in this book? <laughs> and then I just also was like, by making a composite character yes. of them, I could say the truth of what they did, mm -hmm. say the truth of how things happened for me to move the story forward, but also disguise them mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a yeah. little bit. Yeah, no, but I think that's fair. No one needs to know every person you encounter every single day. They're yeah. not going to be able to follow that as a yeah. book. Yeah. So uh, when you're talking about portrayal of yourself also, that's always uh, also a very interesting thing. When you're, you're putting yourself forward as Nicole in the book, do you think of her as a separate character, as you? I mean, how do you kind of approach her? No, I think that she might be like more emo than I am. Mm, mm. Um, you know, I because uh, to me, like the joyful parts of my life are such a non-story. Like I would never write a book that was like I had a great time and then I laughed so much and I love my friends. The end. <laughs> like that just isn't a good. Like I would never pitch that and I would never buy that. But but isn't that funny though that like all of our <laughs> stories have to be kind of dark and like, to be good like that's what's it but that's what's i'm the most gra i gravitate towards that the most yeah i, I love too, traumatic so. coming of age yeah mm, like yeah. that iguana girl <laughs> story that yeah, you assign you. is like mm. a perfect comic to yeah. me so that's what i'm mm. attracted to so that's what i write mm -hmm. because that's what i like so what about visually um when you're portraying yourself visually do you think about how uh, was it a process trying to draw yourself? I mean, clearly using, you're using photo references and calling Dr. Laura, you also have another style for your, for your childhood pieces that's more cartoony. Mm -hmm. So how do you approach drawing yourself? Well, I mean, I thought I was drawing people pretty photorealistic. And then like I have this ex who's a, like a professional artist painter who was like, man, you're gonna be so bummed when you find out how big heads really are. <laughs> <laughs> Because I just, I don't know, I was like, this is pretty photorealistic, right? Like, whoa. Emotional truth versus <laughs> realism. <laughs> like, I just, that's how I see, I mean, I just like, this, this is as close to a photograph as is possible. That's because it's going through my own personal filter of what life looks like a little bit. Um, Will you so wait, that, will you restate the rest of the question? So, like, um, in terms of creating the, your, yourself yeah. as a character, well, visually a character. and everywhere else, yeah. I don't know. Well, for calling Dr. Laura, and I use this thematically here a little bit, mm. When I started calling Dr. Laura, I was like, the whole thing's gonna be photorealistic, and I'm gonna have all these childhood scenes, you know, where I get traumatized and whatever, because they tell the story, not just because I like that. Um, but I was drawing it from photos. I would find photos of myself at five years old and then like redraw it, but I'm crying, and I was like, this is not as fun as I thought it was gonna be. <laughs> and I know that I'm gonna have to like do this for at least two years, this process. It took five years, but I was like, I'm gonna have to, I have to make this sustainable. So what's sustainable? And I was like, well, I like drawing people in this simple black and white style with these big heads, and they're kind of flat, and they look like this. And I was like, that's kind of good. Because A, I'm getting through the scene faster, drawing it faster, but B, it kind of reflects how you're the quality of your memory from when you're a child versus your memories when you're an adult. Because when you're an adult, they are more grayscale. They are more malleable. They're more, you know, there's more going on. They're more vivid. And when you're, the memories from when you're a kid are a little bit more black and white and set. 
you're like, this is the memory. This is how it happened. You, you, you drop that, that technique, though, in fetch. I use it just a little bit. Mm, okay. We had it in the uh, feral child part. Oh, right. Okay, that's bit. true. A little bit. Yeah. Just a little bit. But this is a little bit less child trauma heavy than uh, dog <laughs> trauma heavy. Um, pick your traumas. Yeah. <laughs> but otherwise, how I draw myself, I don't know. I just like, pick a hairstyle. I gave myself better hair as a teenager than mm, I actually mm, had. Mm, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't yeah, know. Yeah. I don't know where fake Nicole ends and real Nicole begins. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, that's a big question. Except for if you think you know me after you read this book, you don't actually. I'm right. Well that, that is a huge thing, right? Yeah. 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 Like not, not to, you know, sorry, but, mm. but like I saw Aileen Kaminsky Crumb speak at mm -hmm. MoCA one year and she was like, people read my books. They think they know me. They don't fucking know me. Yeah. And I was like, well, it's kind of true. Like, you know, mm. about a person, mm -hmm. you know, some things that they've chosen to edit mm -hmm. and show you and share with you. Mm -hmm. But even though it feels like a diary, it's not literally my diary. Mm -hmm. the, the, you, the, you, they do know some of the stories that you might tell them at a party already. It's hard because now there's a lot of stories I can't tell at a party because I feel like I'm repeating exactly. myself. Okay, here's a question. This is something I've noticed from doing memoir. Uh, sometimes the, the, the comic book story will replace my memory of the thing. Oh, always. Like, it, uh, actually, yeah, it happens every time. Well, so you, you draw a picture, you dr draw it as a comic and... That's the memory. That's the memory then. But I, I feel like that's why Creepy. I started doing diary comics. Like I, you know, I got, it's in the book, I got in a car accident when I was 17, I got a head injury and my memory got really weird after mm -hmm. that. And so I really started keeping a visual diary way more religiously after that because mm. my memory was garbage. Oh, wow. It was just gone. And then that really helped me remember things. I took tons of pictures and I would draw and write everything that happened. And then also it made me feel like I understood what the truth was. Like, you know, later, if somebody second guessed something, like say like we worked mm. together and I filed a bunch of stuff and then you saw me a week later and you're like, did you file these? I would be like, I legitimately don't know. Uh. I don't know if that happened. But if I had a written or drawn version of that, I could look at that and be like, oh, I did file them. So you have huge file cabinets then somewhere. Yeah. Wow. I have a walk-in closet in my apartment in LA that is like floor to ceiling Tupperware full of diaries. I have 600 diary page comics <gasps> that I have not yet published because I've been too busy making these new comics. Girl. <laughs> wow. OK. Um, so do you think of your work as political? Yes. Yes, I do. OK. Mm. I can't share it with you. Can I? It's dog um, <laughs> I, I think about it political in a personalist political way, like kind of a feminist and or 90s feminist way. Like, I want people to read these books and feel like they're getting to know somebody, you mm -hmm, know, because right. I'm being vulnerable on the page, and that's creating a bridge with the readers. And they're getting to know somebody who's queer. They're getting mm -hmm. to know somebody who's a feminist. They're getting to know somebody who's Syrian-American. They're going to know somebody who's vegan. Mm -hmm. And so if they have never met a person like that, this might, like, mm -hmm. media in your mind is kind of what fills in the gaps of people you've never met or experienced. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And that's why representation is so important. So my hope is that then when they have the opportunity to, like, be like, vegans are stupid, you know, vegans are so, it's so hard. And then they can be like, well, I just read this comic where it actually was not that hard. Or they'll be like, you know, oh, I have an opportunity to, like, vote on whether queer people get to, like, use a restroom or get married to each other, you know, maybe they'll consider that they know a queer person, you know, be it ever so comically. Yeah. So, I mean, and, and, and I mean, as a uh, Arab American, lesbian cartoonist, I mean, you're swim swimming in privilege, obviously. So, so like, how do you handle all of that? <laughs> Why would I, I am swimming in privilege yeah. because I'm feminine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I still get straight privilege. Mm -hmm. You know, I could come into a coffee shop and be like, hey, how's it you know, and like, <laughs> Flip my hair around. <laughs> if I was like a butch person or a gender queer person, I couldn't really yeah. flaunt that. And I'm like pretty white looking, mm -hmm. like basically. Mm -hmm. You know, if you didn't hear me yelling at you about Tabuli, you wouldn't know. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so I do have that. So I feel like I get, and also I live in America. You mm -hmm. know, if I was a queer Syrian person somewhere right. else, right. Oh, hell no. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. that would be hard. Also, my name, if, if mm -hmm. a couple of different things were shifted in the world, my name would have been Hassanan Shaheen. Mm -hmm. My grandfather would have named me Hassan. Mm -hmm. Our last name was originally Shaheen. Like, my life would have been totally different. Mm -hmm. But since it's not, and I have all these privileges, I would like to be able to use them mm -hmm. and use the, the platform I have and privilege I have and lack of, you know, a safety I have yeah, yeah. to tell these stories. So something like, I mean, the, the project you're talking about with doing with Judith Butler, I mean, that's, I mean, talk about giving back in a, in a political, social way, uh, cultural way. I mean, you're, you're I, mean, I mean, there is something about uh, uh, trying to make the world a better place. I mean, that is something that, we hope to do as artists, right? I mean, that's part of it. Yeah. I mean, one of my, I have mission statements in life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys have mission statements. You've been to a Tony Robbins seminar or something. But 
one of my mission statements in life, and it's been like this for almost 20 years, is um, you know helping empower people through self-expression. Mm. So you know the majority of my life, or not my life, but like my adulthood has been mm -hmm. teaching self-publishing workshops and zine workshops and going into old age homes and going mm -hmm. to like homeless youth centers and whatever and teaching, giving people the tools to express themselves in media and reproduce that and amplify their voices for mm. social change. Mm -hmm. And since that's one of my mission statements, you know, everything I do, even like this job or this book or whatever, yeah. all kind of goes along with that. Yeah, that's right. You, you did do work on, in senior citizen homes, yeah? Yeah, I volunteered Making, yeah. every we, every Friday for ten yeah. years, uh, up until this year. Basically, I volunteered with senior citizens who were low income and had dementia, and physical, mental disabilities mm -hmm. in Portland, and then I made a comic and zine about them that turned into a book mm -hmm. called Tell It Like It Is. It's awesome. Yeah. I love amplifying <laughs> other people's voices. There's yeah. room for all of us, and if we come help each other, then we're like a team. We're like a yeah. mob that we could take over because, you know, s straight white cis men aren't the only people that <laughs> exist, and like rich, thin people aren't the only people who exist. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, more voices, yes. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, I wanted to ask you about also your experience with, you know, once you got into the kind of book world, right, as opposed to just making zines, you worked with editors. Mm -hmm. um, and as we know, kind of editing and editor, um, working with editors is a big deal with comics because it's, unlike prose, it's a complicated process to edit a comic. So how was your experiences with editors? I love it, and my only issue is when they're not harsh enough with me. Interesting. Like, I... I love having an editor because if you've ever put out a whole, like a multi-hundred page book with no editor and then looked at it a year later, you're like, fuck. You know, you spent so much time on it, you gave it to everyone you knew, you sold it, and then you're like, oh, there's a t handwritten typo on the first page. Mm. Or like, this makes no narrative sense, or this is sideways or whatever. So I was excited because this, the first book, Calling Dr. Laura, the first you know, full-length graphic narrative, the story was important to me, mm. and I wanted to make sure I was getting across the things I wanted to. Mm -hmm. So talking to an editor, she helped me emotionally deepen the book and learn how to say those things. Because especially with Autobio, we take things for granted. Mm -hmm. You know, like having an editor be like, why is your teddy bear named after your stepdad? And I was like, what are you, what are you talking about? Or she's like, well, she's like, why is your teddy bear named Ramondo? And I was like, well, that's obviously my stepdad's name. And she was like, why is, he, why is that? <laughs> and I was like... God, because my mom made me name it after my stepdad when he gave it to me to, you know, like be a nice thing. Um, Which is right. Right? So like to you as a stranger, you're like, that's weird. Yeah, but yeah. to me, I had taken it for granted. So having an editor was having mm -hmm. another set of eyes on a story that I had taken for granted. Mm -hmm. And I appreciated that. And yeah. I was like, you know, I don't know how to make money. Like I <laughs> come from a punk subculture. We don't make, we don't got no money. <laughs> like, the editor from New York and a literary agent is going to tell me some special words to say yeah. that will make money appear and make the book better? Great. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm, like, so happy to have that and then be able to share it with you mm. guys. Do, do, you, do you feel like you ran into editors who didn't understand uh, the editing process for comics? Or was that a bit of a learning curve for them? Yes. Mm. Let me tell you a horse. Sit or mm. Do you have a, can this be a flashlight? <laughs> yes. All right, my first book, mm -mm. Colin Dr. Laura. <laughs> I sold it to a publisher who bum, shall bum, not bum. be named. <laughs> I had never worked with an editor before, comics or otherwise. I had just had friends put out my books. They're like, your book looks great. It's printed now. Um, mm. So this editor was like, I was like, what's the editing process? She's like, you know what? I trust you. I see you've done 350 pages of published work. I trust you. Just go make it, and I'll see you in two years when your deadline comes. And I was like, awesome. Wrote the whole book myself. Drew it myself. Inked it myself. Had like 200-something pages scanned fixed, sent, worked for like two and a half years, sent them to her on time, didn't hear anything back, and I was like, whoa. And, I, and one of my friends had been working on a book for Scholastic that he was having to turn in at pencil stage, and I was like, yeah, I guess my editor just trusts me a little more than yours. <laughs> Stupid. Um, so I sent it to her, fully inked. I didn't hear anything back. I was like, do you have any edits for me? And she's like, no, it looks great. And I was like, oh my god, awesome. I nailed it. I knocked it out of the park. I'm actually as good as I thought I was. I was like, you like the end? The end ended on a joke. It was like a wiener dog playing the part of my mom as my coming out story. And she was like, no, it seems great. And I was like, awesome. And then, thank God, the publisher then, I got this word, the publisher's like, we want to publish your, this, this book, at, um, this 14 by 17 giant ass book. We want to publish it at um, the size that Fun Home is. That small kind of half letter size. So that means your pages are going to be this big and the gutters are going to be this, like, this big. You have huge white gutters, and the pages are going to be this big, illegible. No, 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 And no. I was like, no, 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 I can't do that. No, 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 no. And then uh, they were like, oh, well, that's fine. We love the book. Just redraw the book. Ha, 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 ha. You guys 
guys know, you would be like, all right, here I go, you know? I was like, you can't do that. It's like, guys, I'm going to reshoot a documentary. Like, you can't do that. So we, we left and found a new publisher. But in between, my agent was like, you know, Nicole, it's possible no one's going to want to buy this book. And if no one buys this book, we'll just put it away in a shelf, in a drawer, and we'll work on something else. And I was like, that's fine. I don't care. I'm done with it. I want it to be out of here. Who cares? And we found an editor, and she was like, yes, I want to publish this book with Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, which is a big deal. They published Fun Home. They published Best American Ops. They published Lord of the Rings. Um, you know, just no big deal. A any crossovers? No. Me and JRR. Um, <laughs> but... She was like, I want to know if you'll go emotionally deeper. And so we had long, processy conversations about my personal life and how much I was willing to say and whether I would do it. And that ended up being 150 pages of new material. No, 50 pages of new material, a year and a half of edits. Like every place there was a typo, I had to redo it by hand. Everything was by hand. It just, the book ended up taking five years, but originally I took two years to draw. So that is my horror story for you. So don't cry when we give you an edit. Thank God. God in heaven above that it's in pencil. So I'm assuming Fetch, you did pencils and you sent it to the editor. Yes. But honestly, and this is a good tip for everybody, like if you hate, some people say things like I have people involved in the process and I hate their opinions. I'm like, that is the worst thing I've ever heard in my life. I hate you. And I'll write down, we're on the phone, I'll write like stupid, stupid, you don't understand anything, it's so stupid. <laughs> And then, but I'm like, oh, totally, okay, yeah. Mm, 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 mm. You know, and then I sit on it and I try to incorporate it and whatever. But if I don't like what the editor is saying or if they're not giving me the kind of feedback I want, I'll still listen to them and be like, sure, thank you. But I also have friends who I really trust, who I think are smart, who are also teachers, so they know how to give constructive, supportive feedback, and I'll ask them for their feedback. I never take my work to the Debbie Downers I know. Never do. You, you all have a friend who's a Debbie Downer who hates themselves, so then they ex exude that into the world. Don't show them your work. Show the people who know how to be constructive and friendly and tell you what you did right and then what you need to fix. Uh, but I, and I think it's important not to, right, it, not, not to always listen to, I mean, not all criticism is something you can use, right? No, and well, some people I just know will get in my head and just say weird offhand things that will forever stick in my craw. Like I have a very good friend at a certain point out of nowhere, he's like, well, I mean, like you're not Chris Ware or something. And I'm not. But I was like, what the fuck is that supposed to mean? So I just, I mean, this was probably like 11 years ago he said this, and I'm still like, what are you talking about? I'm not Chris Ware. Like, it was in regards to like my punk diary comics, which are not, but I just, I can't ever give my work to that person because they don't know how to be kind and helpful at the same time. So do you think about that when you, I mean, I don't know if you've edited a book, but certainly you've, as, as a teacher, you constantly are giving kind of feedback and edits and stuff. So how do you, how do you do that from the other side? Well, I don't know. I mean, I think at the end of the day, I just want the best for their work. Mm -hmm. And I feel like maybe the, the fear going into critique at someone's going to be like, you're trash, you're garbage, you don't deserve to even be alive, get out of here. But I'm like, you all deserve to be here. <laughs> uh, I already like your work. I know what your work looks like. I want it to be the best it can be. So these things are just going to enhance it and make it even better. These are just going to make it more readable so the reader doesn't have to take a moment and be like, what the fuck? That's a dog on a skateboard. It looks like, you know, a toad on a rocket ship. <laughs> like... I just want to be able to, sh to tell you, like, okay, add a tail, add some ears, and then I'll really understand this is a dog on a skateboard. I'm just not here to squash anyone's hopes, because that's not, because yeah. it's art. Yeah. You know, I know that it's, like, part trade school, part art school, part, you know, whatever, but, like, this is art. This is your emotional, this is your feelings, this is your voice, this is, like, your song coming from within. I'm not here to be like, stop singing! I'm just like, okay, try singing, like, a little bit up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's good.